Tonight's game in Fenway Park between the Boston Red Sox and the Milwaukee Brewers is the World Series for third place in the Eastern Division of the American League. At this time of year, rookies brought up from the minors are trying to show that they deserve a spot on next year's team, while veterans are trying to still hang on, and stars like Wade Boggs are still chasing records. With all of the problems in baseball this year, there's a longing for a return to the good old days, to tradition, and no better place to find it than Fenway Park, where 30,000 fans turned out on a cold night to watch Wade Boggs, a legend in the making, chase the memory of Boston's greatest baseball hero, Ted Williams. Ted Williams. Boston Red Sox took a firm grip on the most valuable player award in the American League. The very first time I ever met him was uh, spring training in 77 when I was in uh, Class A ball. And uh, I'll never forget it. I walked up to him and said, hi, Mr. Williams, my name's Wade Boggs. And first thing he said, can you hit? And I said, well, I, I've done well in the past. And he, he goes, well, the jury's still out. And ever since then, uh, I've been defending myself uh, as far as Ted goes. Would he still say that today? I think he would. Uh, as, as well as I know Ted, I'm, I'm sure he would say that. Four straight batting titles and the so The jury's on, still out. Yeah. Fans often say they just don't make them like Ted anymore. And yet, here was Wade Boggs with a lifetime batting average of 352, winner of four consecutive American League batting titles, arriving four and a half hours before game time to take batting practice, and in the last week of the season, extra fielding practice as well. Have you ever met anybody that was so obsessive about hitting as, as Ted Williams? Well, I thought I was until I met Ted, mm -hmm. because uh, that's all I ever did as a little kid, get up at 8 o'clock in the morning and, and uh, sunset to, uh, sunrise to sunset, uh, just swing a bat, hitting rocks, uh, anything you could find, tennis balls. And then I met Ted Williams, and uh, I found out that he was more obsessed with hitting than I was. I discovered that little game between the hitter and the pitcher. And I knew that a guy was a certain type pitcher. I knew that he was either a high or low ball pitcher. I knew where these balls sunk or rode, rode in the plate. Um, I know how he got me out. Um, all I knew what the count was. I knew what the wind was doing. I knew what the score was, I knew the inning was in. So all of these things, and I knew the catcher a little bit. So, and I didn't guess that right all the time, but I guessed enough that I had a lot of pitches I was looking for and I got them. Ted Williams lines a single to right and don't... If you're gonna wait for a good fastball pitcher, and you are going to determine when I see that it's high, low, inside or outside, or fastball or curveball, I'm gonna swing. Buddy, that's too late. That is too late. You can't do it. The ball comes up there in a third of a second, and you can't bring the bat from here to here in that amount of time. So you have to say, high fastball and start, and it's not there, you leave it go. But if it's there, boom, you've made, you've done half the job, halfway to it, bang, you're in front. The one thing that, that Ted told me uh, in spring training of 82 that, that he said, uh, uh, one thing that I would do to your swing is never change it. <laughs> And that, that really meant a lot to me because that's probably one of the greatest compliments you could ever get. Down the stretch this year, Boggs pursued another batting title, just as Ted Williams had done with his rivals in autumns long ago. And your goal, as you've stated so many times and did then, was to be the greatest hitter whoever lived. Well, I, you know, I feel embarrassed sometimes. I said this the other day, I was someplace. I said, you know, it's great to be introduced to banquets. Say, oh, the greatest hitter that ever lived, you know? <laughs> I've heard guys say that, and people believe it sometimes. But I say this, I don't believe that. And I would be happy, just as happy as I could be, if somebody said he was as good as Ruth, or Gary, or Fox, or Simmons, or DiMaggio, or... Aaron, or Mays, or Musial, I'll accept that and be perfectly, perfectly happy. But you've thought about hitting enough, then you, who, who was better? I think the best is Babe Ruth, <laughs> or Lou Gehrig. 
Ted Williams was the last player to bat 400 or better. He thinks perhaps that's because today's players are distracted by outside business interests and the media. Some say Williams' era was a simpler time. I don't think America was simpler. Ted Williams spent three years in the Korean War, and, and uh, who knows what kind of statistics he would have put up in the prime of his life. I think that that, that, that was a distraction for him. Uh, he might say that, that business interests nowadays is a distraction for us, but I think that the war times is a giant distraction. I left at the age of 33. I'm going to return at the age of 35. Uh, I know that uh, as uh, I got older, even in the, in the early 30s, that I was progressively getting uh, a harder time. It was harder for me to get in shape. So I know that after two years off, it's going to be even harder. Williams served as a Marine pilot in World War II as well, and still wound up with 521 career home runs and a career batting average of 344. Many baseball experts think he is the greatest hitter of all time. As if world wars weren't enough, opposing teams employed bizarre defensive strategies to try and stop Williams. This is the Williams shift, where the opposing team would put all their players, except one, on the right-hand side of the field. Williams laughed out loud when he came to bat and faced this the first time. Typically defiant, he still tried to hit to the right side. But one time, he slapped a ball to left field for an inside-the-park home run. Well, they do uh, do some shifts on you, do they not? Oh, without a doubt. They've, they've tried everything in the book from having the second baseman and shortstop stand behind second and one of them move when the pitcher's winding up. So they've tried everything. So you feel a little uh, kindred uh, spirit, a little kinship with Ted Williams. I mean, he had the... the I think an eight-man shift at one time where there was nobody on the left side of the diamond. Well, that's what made Ted so phenomenal, is, is he could still pull the ball and beat a shift of seven people to one side and, and still hit 400. That, that's what makes Ted Williams so phenomenal. I can see it in, in right field right now. There's a red seat painted out there, and that, they said that that's where Ted hit one ball. And when you look at it, it, that's that's light years away <laughs> compared to where Jose Canseco hits them and and some of the big guys that, that I've seen hit home runs here. What what do you think is his was his secret to hitting? I think drive to be the best. Ted Williams never would like to finish second. I'm sure no matter what he did, and anything in life uh, he wanted to catch the biggest fish. He wanted to score the winning touchdown if he played football. He wanted to score the winning basket in basketball. And I, I follow along those same lines. Uh, whatever I do, ping pong, no matter what, I want to win and I want to be the best. And, and it's a desire that some people have and some people don't. What, uh, how would you like to be recalled then when you're, let's say you go to a banquet and so on? What you... Well, I've been a very fortunate guy since I left baseball. Uh, in, in, and I could say that about all through life, really. Uh, I owe it all to baseball. I owe it all to baseball. It's the greatest game. I remember I heard Babe Ruth, he couldn't hardly talk on the thing and says the only game is baseball. Boy, I agree with the Babe. Ted Williams greeted by thousands of fans in Boston. On a chill autumn afternoon in 1960, with his team in seventh place and just 10,000 fans in Fenway Park, Ted Williams came to bat for the last time. And as if in a storybook, he hit a home run. He would not come out of the dugout to tip his cap to the fans. Writer John Updike, who was in the stands that day, wrote, Gods do not answer letters.